Hey, everybody say, it's not over. It's not over. Hey, my name is Alex. I'm so excited to share with you guys tonight to continue this story of Saul and Samuel and now David. What Christian shared, he talked all about pride. King Saul was a man that was full of pride. He built monuments to himself. He ignored the words of God. And the favor of God was subsequently removed from his life. And right there at the end, and Christian got right to it, Samuel and Saul are together. Samuel goes up to his friend, Saul. And he's saying, Saul, you've messed up. The favor of God is leaving you. And in this tense moment between these two friends, you have Samuel and Saul. And Saul grabs the robe of Samuel and he tears it. And there's fierceness as the two look at each other. And Samuel's standing there with his torn robe and he fires back at Saul and says, God has torn this kingdom from you and given it to somebody who's better. And that was the last time these two ever saw each other again, the effects of pride. Now, I wanna move on to, to Samuel and consider how Samuel felt in this moment. He's kind of the one we forget about, but he's the constant through this entire story. And I'd like to think that Samuel in this moment has to feel betrayed. He has to feel hurt. Like this is a deep wound. It's not just, you know, this minor issue, this argument that these two friends got into. He was betrayed by a friend, somebody that he had counted on, somebody that he'd hitched his life to, right? Saul had ignored Samuel. He'd ignored God. The favor of God is removed from his life. And now he's left with this feeling of loss, this feeling of betrayal. Have you ever been in a place where you felt hurt, betrayed, lost? Samuel now finds himself without a friend, sort of without a vocation. He's alone, he's hurt, and now he's gotta rebuild a life. He's gotta pick up the pieces and start from scratch. And if you've ever been in a place like that, you know, it's right there in those moments where you feel so vulnerable, right there in those moments where things seem stressful, where you're not sure what's gonna happen next. This is the moment that the enemy comes. In this moment of pain, God speaks to Samuel and says in 1 Samuel 16, 1, he says, Samuel, how long will you grieve? How long? This grief, this pain, Samuel, it's gonna eat you up inside. And God would say the same thing to each of us today. Maybe you came in with some grief and some pain and some stress and some anxiety, and God would say, how long are you gonna let these things control your life? Because the longer that you go, the longer that they're gonna start tearing you up on the inside, they will eat you alive. How long will you grieve? Samuel feels like a failure. And in these moments where you feel this intense stress and anxiety, and you're not sure what's gonna happen next, and you're at your most vulnerable, this is when the enemy comes, right? This is when the enemy tries to dig a wedge in between you and your family, you and your loved ones, you and the faith that you know. This happens to Jesus in Matthew 4, 2. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So the enemy comes to Jesus after this incredible fast, this time of 40 days and 40 nights of, of not eating. And the enemy comes and he tries to distract Jesus. He tries to get his mind to go down a path that he shouldn't go. He tries to drive a wedge between Jesus and his heavenly father. How do we overcome the voice of the enemy in our lives? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered, it is written. It is written. You see, the mistake that the enemy made when he approached Jesus is that he forgot that Jesus had just been with the Father. 
Are you hearing me? Jesus had just been with the Father. That's the mistake he's gonna make with us, right? When the enemy tries to come and speak into our life and whisper and distract, he's gonna forget that we've just spent time with the Father. How do we overcome the enemy in our life? We speak God's word and God's promises and God's truth right back to him. Right back to him. Listen, the enemy might say to you, it's impossible, but what does your God say? God says, with me, all things are possible. The enemy says, nobody loves you, but our God says, I love you, I'm for you, and you are mine. The enemy might say, you can't go on, but God says, my grace is all that you need. And the enemy might say, you're nothing, you're alone, but God says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Listen, this is how we make the enemy run, church. We meet him with the word. Every time he'll flee. So Samuel hears from God and God says, Samuel, how long will you grieve? So Samuel, he's all out there in his feelings and then God speaks again in 1 Samuel 16, one and he says, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king amongst his sons. And so Samuel is sent to Jesse's house now on a new assignment, find this new king. And look at how he responds in 16.2. He says, how can I go? If Saul hears it, He'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me him whom which I declare to you. You're gonna do what I tell you to do. See, Saul is the king that God allowed. Are you with me? Saul is the king that God allowed. The people cried out against Samuel. Samuel, we need a king. Samuel, we need, we need a ruler. Samuel, give us someone to protect us. And Samuel said, you already have one. You already have God. And they said, no, give us a king. And so God allowed it. And when God allowed it, they got Saul, a man deep in pride, a man that ended up being morally bankrupt, hard-hearted, and disqualified himself and lost the favor of God. This was a king in the flesh that God allowed. But now God says, Saul, it's time for you to move over and get out of the way. And Samuel, you are gonna anoint my king, the one that I will declare to you. And God said, it's not over. Somebody say, it's not over tonight. It's not over. God is leading even when we don't see it. Even when we don't see it. See, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse and there he sees seven sons. And after he sees each one of these sons, God says, no, here's another one, no, here's another one, no. And I don't know about you, but this is the point for me a lot of times that I start getting real frustrated. I'm like, God, I met you where you said to go, and now it's roadblock after roadblock, it's no, it's no answer, what am I supposed to do? Maybe you even start talking yourself into going down a lane that you hadn't previously considered. Did God really say Jesse's house or maybe it was the house across the street? Maybe I'll find the king if I travel across the street, right? This is the moment where life gets really, really hard. This is the moment where there doesn't seem to be a way out when our options seem to be all over with and done. This is the moment that we quit. This is the moment that we give up. It's the moment that we pivot. It's the moment that we try to control the situation, make it work on our own because in our pride, we think we've got a better answer. But when the enemy tells you that you're all out of options, there's not another way left, God says it's not over. Samuel had to be so frustrated, right? like standing there in this stranger's house. He's like, God, are you kidding me? Like this man, I don't even know this man. He doesn't know me. And I am just sitting here in this parade line of his sons. He doesn't even know why. Can you imagine for a moment how incredibly awkward that must have been for everybody involved? And I think, um, I think if you look at the sons, you had Eliab and the seven oldest sons. And it says that when he walks in the room, that Samuel looks at Eliab and says, this guy, this guy. You know, it's kind of like if any of you watch football, uh, on, on draft day, they'll say, uh, he's, he, looks, he looks like a quarterback, right? He looks like the kind of guy that can lead this team. And that's what Samuel does. He walks in, and he's like, this guy, he could be king. He looks kingly. He could be a king. But see, God didn't want another king 
that looked the part. God didn't want another king that was pleasing to the flesh. God was doing a new thing. They already had a king like that. They already had Saul. And what Samuel didn't know is that there was another son out in the field. There was another son that Jesse hadn't mentioned. There was another son that he hadn't even considered bringing into the house. But this son was God's answer. This son was the option that nobody had thought about, and God says to Samuel, it's not over. And we forget, right? We forget that God has the entire playbook. He knows the beginning from the end. And in our moments of frustration and stress, and when God doesn't immediately clear the path, just like we thought he would, we say, God, where are you? God, I thought you said, God, should I, I'm just gonna do something else and maybe you'll stop me. No, God said no, God said wait. Listen to Jesus in in the book of John. This is right after Jesus has been tired and thirsty and he spent time speaking to the woman at the well and the disciples come up and they find Jesus and listen to how this conversation goes. Verse 31, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. I may be in this desperate state, but there's something fueling me. There's an option out there that you don't know about that you haven't even considered yet. See, maybe you think you've tried everything. You've exhausted all your resources. You've thought, you've considered, you tried to work a way through the grief and the pain, the frustration of your situation, but there doesn't seem to be a path forward. But let me tell you, when you align with Jesus, when you're, when you're active in hearing his voice, when you allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life, God says there are new possibilities, there are new options, there are things out there that you're not aware of yet, that you haven't heard of yet. It's God's best for you and it's greater than anything you could ever think, dream, or imagine. Sometimes in the middle of the promise, right, or in the middle of the problem, we stop waiting on God and we choose our own way out. Have you ever done that? (laughs) I do that more often than I care to admit. That is pride, that is the root of pride. I can figure this out, I can get there on my own, I can work it. I can make it work. I was thinking about that this week, this idea of, man, I don't wanna divert God and miss your moment for me. I don't wanna miss your moment for a cheap imitation of a moment that I can make. I don't wanna mess on my hands. It made me think of this story that my wife told me. Um, She was in high school and she used to go to Titans football games a lot with her dad. Uh, They had company tickets, it was right on the 50 yard line unbelievable seats, right? And so they show up one Sunday to this game. Now, this is no ordinary Titans football game because this is an AFC playoff game against the Buffalo Bills. And I just wanna tell you, I think I don't have to tell you, we're all, we're all Tennesseans right here, which means we know what it's like to lose, right? Is that too low for a Saturday? You're like, how dare you? Listen, if Peyton Manning could still sling it and was eligible, he'd be at UT right now, tomorrow, right? Bring him back. Like, we're no strangers to what it's like to lose in the professional sports world. We've been there, we've done that, but this was a playoff game. The hopes were high, like it'd been a long time, but we were there. And she's there on the 50 yard line. They're there with some friends, some coworkers. This guy's there with his son. And they're watching the game and everything is going exactly like you'd hope for if you're a Titans fan. The Titans are winning with minutes left in the game. But then the unthinkable happens. With 16 seconds left in the game, the Bills score. Making the score 16 to 15, the Bills are leading. There's only 16 seconds left in the game. Maybe time for the kickoff, that is it. At this time, (laughs) they were with a coworker, like I told you, and he had brought his teenage son, Matt, there. Now, Matt may be here tonight. Matt, I'm sure you are a good guy. But Matt said, you know what? There's no option. There's no way they can win. There's no path forward. They're gonna lose this game. And Matt said, you know what, guys? I'll see you after the game here in a few minutes. I wanna get a jump on. Uh, I gotta get downstairs. Matt leaves the stadium and goes down to the pro shop because he had his eyes set 
on a Tennessee Titans cheerleader's calendar. Had to have it, had to, had to have this calendar. And so Matt is in the pro shop buying this calendar. Meanwhile, kickoff happens, 16 seconds left in the game. Their largest tight end, this guy named Frank Wycheck, gets the ball. This is a man who has no, there's no reason he should be throwing a football. And he takes the football and he throws it across the field to Kevin Dyson. This wide receiver runs 75 yards down the field, untouched for a touchdown. The Titans win as the game expires. It is one of the greatest moments in sports history. It is known as the Music City Miracle. I know some of you were probably in the room. Maybe you're at home on your couch. People are jumping up and down, high Fiving, hugging, people are getting married, like getting engaged. Like it is, you wouldn't believe, one of the greatest moments in sports history. And Matt missed it because he was buying a calendar at the pro shop for $16. He sold it for $16. You see, God is trying to do something brand new. Do you know that? And he doesn't want you to miss the moment. In scripture, the number seven means completion, right? So why, why, why? When Samuel shows up at the house of Jesse and he sees seven sons, why was it not done? It should be complete, right? The number seven is completion. Did you know that the number eight means something else in scripture too? Number eight stands for new life, and new beginnings. And there was an eighth son. Listen, let me show you. In the Bible, there are eight steps of creation signifying new life. Eight people were saved on Noah's ark, new life. On the eighth day after birth in the Old Testament, children were consecrated before God, new life. Eight words from Jonah and the entire city of Nineveh came to its knees in a giant revival, new life. Doubting Thomas came to believe in a risen Christ eight days after his resurrection, new life. And David was the eighth son, new life. God is doing something brand new. He doesn't just want to complete what you've started. He wants to do something brand new in this city, something brand new in your family, something brand new in you tonight. We don't want to miss our moment, do we, church? It's not over. It's not over. And let me tell you, God doesn't just want completion. This is an example of God doing immeasurably more. Let that sit over us tonight. God doesn't just desire completion and done. He wants immeasurably more for you. Maybe you feel like David tonight, a man that you know really well that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about. But maybe what you know about David is that he's this great warrior that slayed giants. But his story starts here. It starts in this story, forgotten, Less than, an option nobody considered out in the field with sheep. Maybe that's how you feel, an afterthought. Less than, like you aren't seen, like you aren't heard, you aren't appreciated, that if you weren't here, that people wouldn't miss you. When God looks down at David, he says, this is my son. This is my son and he will be a man after my own heart. Maybe you say, I feel less than, I feel like I've, not been, like I've not been seen or heard, like there's no use for me. If that's you, you're in good company. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world, not the popular things, the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Your past doesn't keep you from the greatness of what God wants to do in you. Your past, your issues, your baggage, your stresses, your anxiety, those broken relationships, all the things that the enemy wants to whisper in your times of vulnerability are the things that disqualify you, that keep you down, that keep you uh, away from friends and ministry, that keep you right where you are, that those things that keep you forgotten, God would say, no, 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 my son, my daughter, these are the things I'm gonna use to work through you because in your weakness, I am made strong. Don't quit. It's not over. 
And maybe you feel like Samuel tonight. You've been working at something, but every time you try, it fails, it fails. All you've heard is no, no, no. Every option, it's like, God, there's no way through this. There's no way around this. This situation is gonna be the end of me. It's gonna be the end of my family. Maybe that's where you are. Don't quit. It's not over. There's another option. There's a better option, one you haven't even seen yet. And it's God's best for you. The moment that all of us let go is the moment that we let God lead. Somebody say, it's not over.